But for right now, may I ask you to open up your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And I want to share with you a text from there. But in order to set it up, I need to tell you about my middle son. My middle son is a videographer. And maybe, Jim, that, that may have been the word we were looking for a minute ago. Uh, he has worked for a couple of different companies uh, producing videos. But I talked to him uh, about a year or so back during the pandemic, and he said, Dad, I missed it. And I said, what'd you miss? He said, I finally had a shot at it, but I heard about it too late, and Rich got the job I wanted. I said, what job are you talking about? He said, he is now doing sizzle reels for Fox Sports. I said, what's a sizzle reel? He said, do you know what a sizzle reel is? I said, have to do anything with bacon? He said, no, 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 no. A sizzle reel, he says, say you're watching an NBA game or, or, or a, a football game, and, and right before you go to the commercial, they show the last three seconds of whatever was exciting during that time, you know, whether it's that three-point shot or whether it's the coach yelling or whether it's somebody dancing in the end zone. He said, there's one person who's in charge of that. And the sizzle person sits in the chair in the truck outside the stadium and pulls down little clips all the way through a period of play saying, ooh, this might be the best one. Oh, no, maybe this might be the best one. But you've got eight seconds to make the final decision because they'll say sizzle eight and then you've got to pick, I think, this one or this one. Put them in this order. Put music in with it. If you need any CGs, three, two, one, and it goes out on national television. Doesn't that sound like just a dream? I said, that sounds like a stomach ache to me. I mean, you've got eight seconds and it goes out on national TV. I got to thinking about that and realized God did a whole series of sizzle reels for us. And he does them in Hebrews chapter 11. Take a look there. If you go to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, it begins with this introduction. It's all about faith. Now, faith is what? Can you read it with me up here? Now, faith is, you guys don't sound very confident, okay, for the 9 o'clock service. Let's try that one more time. Now, faith is in what we hope for and about what we do not see. And he says, this is what the ancients were commended for. And what the Hebrew writer does is he starts going through one story after another, emphasizing faith as the important key element for that person's life. Now, I want you to note that he says it is confidence and assurance. It is that thing of, I know that surely God will come through. We can all say there have been moments in the last couple of years when we've said, Lord, are you still here? Father, we can't believe what's happening. We've never experienced this before. But the Hebrew writer says faith is, one more time, let's hit that word, confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now, he goes on to say this, the next slide, if you would, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. I mean, in some ways, I guess that's pretty plain. If you don't trust in God and believe in God, well, then how in the world could you please God? That is pleasing someone you don't trust or even believe in him. But then he starts telling stories. Only really, he doesn't tell the story. He goes back to stories of God's people from thousands of years ago, stories from the Old Testament in the Bible, stories of people that if you did grow up going to church, then you probably would have heard of some of these in Sunday school. I'm sure some of you are Sunday school survivors here today who remember going. Now, for those who've never been to a Sunday school, uh, used to, we would have a, a children's class where, where you would go in the mornings, and my dad being a preacher, uh, early on in my life, I struggled with, it, with a drug problem. Uh, my mom and dad drugged me to church every single Sunday and every single Sunday school time. And sure enough, I, some of the heel marks in the hallway were kids like me. Come on now, you need to go to this. And we would learn these stories. But what the Hebrew writer does is he boils them down to a sizzle reel. Just a few seconds of information. Well, here, let me show you. For instance, here's what the Hebrew writer says about the sizzle reel for Noah. 
famous Old Testament story, and the Hebrew writer boils it down about six chapters in the Old Testament to this. Now by faith, Noah built an ark, warned about things not yet seen, built an ark to save his family. You see, the three-point shot in the Noah story, and the Noah story, of course, is that famous story of God saying, listen, I'm, I'm just, I'm so frustrated with our world, we're going to clean it up and give you a fresh start, and he calls this man Noah. Anybody remember what his wife's name was? Noah and Mrs. Noah, that's correct. Noah and Mrs. Noah and had the three sons named Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives. Anyway, they all get on the ark and God says, I'm going to start things afresh with this story. Now this is a whole six chapters worth, but the Hebrew writer says, you can put it in one verse. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, read that next part with me, built an ark to save his family. Or the story of Abraham. Abraham is more than 13 chapters in the Old Testament. And yet, in the book of Genesis, he boils this down to just three little, little verses. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later inherit as his inheritance, it says, he obeyed and went. Can you read this next line with me? Even though he did not know where he it sounds like somebody driving on the Dallas freeway, doesn't it? They, even though they did not know where they were going, Abraham's story is one of very simple, do you believe in God? God calls this man named Abraham more than 2,000 years ago, in fact, now more than 3,500 plus years ago, and says, will you leave your father and mother and come and go to a place that I'm going to show you? Well, where, where is it? God doesn't tell him. Now, I'm always nervous if somebody says, hey, get in the car and let's go for a ride. And I say, where are we going? They say, don't worry about it. Well, that's the kind of thing somebody says to somebody in a mafia movie, and you never see them again in the movie. You know what I mean? Don't worry about it. Just get in the car, right? <laughs> Abraham says, God, where are you going? And God says, I will show you. So Abraham packs up, leaves his family, trusts God, and heads off towards the promised land, even though he did not know where he was going. Now, if you say to yourself, man, that sounds pretty amazing, wait till you get to my mom's favorite Bible character's sizzle reel. My mother taught Sunday school often, and whenever somebody would be sick or, hey, Mrs. So-and-so is not here for the third grade class, my dad would turn to my mom and say, Mildred, can you cover the class? Yes, she says, I'll take care of it. And she had a box underneath her bed, a shoe box with felt cutouts in it for a thing called flannel graph. Now, I'm going way back here. Do any of my wrinkle homies remember flannel graph? Ha, ha, raise, go ahead, raise your hand. Oh, my goodness, we've got flannel graph pros in here. All right. Now, for those who are saying, what in the world is a flannel graph? It's like early PowerPoint, okay? <laughs> Only it was made out of felt, and they would color. And my mom had a whole set of these, and there'd be a big piece of cloth stretched over a board, and she would just kind of stick them up on there, figures as she told a story, kind of like cartoons on cloth. And my mom was good at it. But, oh, she had one story that was her favorite. Big old stack of these cloth figures with which she would tell the story of the 11th son of of a man named Jacob. Now take your time on this. Abraham, who was asked to leave his father and family and go to a land that he would show him, marries a woman named Sarah and has a child of promise named Isaac. Isaac marries Rebekah, and Isaac and Rebekah have the first twins in the whole Bible. Anybody remember their name? Esau and Jacob. Now Jacob has his name later changed to Israel. Does that sound familiar? It's actually him that is the namesake for the country of Israel, for the Jewish people that bring us, finally, Jesus Christ. But at this moment in the story, Jacob has 12 sons. And I know because of the great teaching that's been done here through the years that you all know their names by heart. Let's just say them together. Uh, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun. And then comes a boy whose name starts with a J, ends with Osef. Just take your time on this one. 
Joseph, and finally, Benjamin. Now, the only reason that I know those names standing here is my mom taught that class enough time, and I always had to go in to help her, and so Joseph's story has been embedded on my heart. But I'm going to ask you to do something preachers don't normally ask you to do. I'm going to ask you, if you have your Bible, to close it. If you're looking at it on your tablet, I'm going to ask you to let it go dark for a minute. Because the Hebrew writer shocked me when he condenses the entire story of Joseph, one of the people in the Old Testament whose more ink is spilled over him than anyone else, he takes this whole story of the life of this guy named Joseph and squeezes it down to one sentence. And it is not a sentence I saw coming. Now, let's just do this. You may never have heard the story of Joseph. Some of our flannel graph pros have. But let's just talk through for a minute the story of Joseph. And I want to give you this challenge. How would you condense this story down to one verse, one sentence? Because I believe Joseph has some pretty good advice for us. It begins with Joseph being this 11th son. Now think about this. There's 12 boys out on the ranch, and you're number 11 in line. All those older brothers, right? Only the word starts to get around that mama loves Joseph better than anybody else. And daddy favors Joseph. And one day, this is what makes Joseph famous for a lot of us, Joseph is awarded something by his father. Anybody remember what it is? His father brings out, I just see out on the farm him bringing this box out. And all the boys start gathering around. He says, line up, boys. And he's got this box and thinking, man, what is this? And he walks right past Reuben, the oldest boy. And walks right past all the way down. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Dan is looking at it. Naphtali walks all the way down, and they all know where he's heading. He gets to Joseph. And in my mind, he's opening this box. Probably wouldn't have been in a box of that day. But he holds up a beautiful, multicolored coat. If you've ever seen the musical, it's called the coat of what? Many colors. Now, you need to understand, a coat like that first was very valuable because of the difficulty in making a multicolored piece of cloth. But second, it's a long-sleeved coat. That's literally what the language means. You say, well, Jeff, why does it matter that it was long-sleeved? What's the first thing you do when you're going to go out on a farm and work if you've got sleeves on? Roll up your sleeves, right? A long-sleeved coat said, oh, this person is not destined to have to work that way. He's going to be back in the office. It's like somebody giving a farm boy a tux. I mean, what does that tell you, right? And when Joseph puts this coat on, all of his brothers are just sick of him. I mean, no wonder Joseph used to go around telling them dreams he had of how important he was going to be. One of the first stories we have is of Joseph coming to breakfast and telling his brothers, Hey, guys, I had a dream last night. What kind of dream? Well, I dreamed that Daddy was the sun and Mama was the moon and all of you brothers were stars in the sky. And they thought, well, yeah, that's right. I'm a star. He says, I was a star too. Well, what happened in your dream? Well, all of a sudden, all of the stars and the sun and the moon bowed down to my star. Now, isn't that just asking for a beat down if you told that to a bunch of old brothers and, right? All these brothers, what? Yeah, and then he tells them another one. We were all sheaves of wheat, and all of your sheaves of wheat bowed down to mine. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. Well, when the coat thing finally happens, one of the brothers says, I've had it. That's it. I'm going to kill him. No, 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 you can't do that. They're out working in the field by a well, and one of the brothers grabs young Joseph and throws him in the well. No, it doesn't kill him. He lands in the bottom and rolls over, and I can just see Joseph looking up going, what in the world? And the brother starts to pick up rocks to throw them down on Joseph and drown him and kill him. But one of the other brothers says, no, no, we can't do that. That's not right. And they're arguing over one another when a, a group of Ishmaelite traders come by. And one of the brothers says, hey, would you like to buy a slave? And they fish Joseph up out of the well, and they sell him into slavery. And just before they leave, they say, excuse me, we'll take the coat. They peel that coat off of Joseph. 
they kill an animal and they dip the coat in the animal's blood and then they take it back to Jacob and say, oh, Father, there was a terrible fight and a, and a wild animal killed our brother Joseph. And while Jacob is crying over his son, Joseph is being led away to a land he's never been to called Egypt. He doesn't know how to speak the language. He doesn't understand the culture. And he's tied and he's sold as a slave. Now he starts off as it's like a roller coaster ride. Oh, I'm daddy's favorite. And then, oh no, I'm going to be killed in this well. And oh, I'm going to be sold into slavery. And when he gets into Egypt, the uh, head of the security prison buys him. And he says, you're going to clean out the cells. Can you imagine? Do you know what it feels like to have family turn their back on you? Do you know what it feels like to have the folks that ought to protect you and stand with you do you wrong? Joseph does. And Joseph finds himself in a place with no one to help him, scrubbing out the stone floors of a prison and saying, God, I trust you. Is my daddy going to come? Is somebody going to come for me? And sure enough, God blesses him. The owner of the prison says, the one that's running it says, man, goodness, you're really good. You're really great. In fact, I'm going to make you not the, the water boy. I'm going to make you in charge. And before you know it, Joseph ends up back on top as the head of the whole household. The story in the Bible says that Joseph becomes in charge of everything in the house. Oh, man, what a ride. He's back on top again. And then all of a sudden he meets a, a woman. Anybody remember who that woman was? It happened to be the wife of the guy that runs the prison, the wife of his owner. The Bible says that she noticed that Joseph was handsome and well-built. And I can see that many of the men in this church know the burden of being handsome and well-built. I'm sure at malls and other places, women's heads turn as you walk by, and God bless you for dealing with that. But in Joseph's story, this, uh, this wife spots him, and man, she comes on to him. Hey, good looking. What you got cooking? <laughs> How's about cooking something? Uh, yeah, you all know where this is heading, right? She propositions this young man. Now, Joseph may be 18 years old at this point. I want you to imagine, fellas, being 17 or 18 years old, away from anybody who knows you, away from any accountability, and a beautiful, powerful woman comes on to you. Joseph says, ma'am, no way. How could I possibly, how could I possibly do that? You're married. Your husband's my boss. How could I dishonor him? How could I dishonor God? Man, I, I drop my hat to Joseph at that point. I tip it and say, that's pretty impressive, young man. But the Bible says she just kept coming after him and kept coming after him. Guys, let's be honest. How long would it take you before you were like, God, I, 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 I just don't know what to do. And then the Bible says she just grabbed him by the coat and tried to pull him to the bedroom. I mean, at what point would you say, God, she's got my coat. I'm sorry. There's nothing else I can do, right? I mean, you know, this isn't my fault. But you know what Joseph does? When she grabs him by that coat, he just lets that coat slip right out of his arms and runs out of the house. By the way, can I talk to the young people just for a second here? I see several young men and women. There's going to be a moment in life where you're going to be someplace you shouldn't ought to be. Or somebody's going to be trying to get you to do something you should not to do. The best thing to do may be to remember Joseph and just get out of there. Can I get an oh yeah from the older folks here for just a minute? The best thing to do may be just to run out of there because that's exactly what Joseph does. He gets out of there with his integrity intact. Well done, Joseph. Only problem is... When her husband comes home, that woman's holding up Joseph's coat saying, look what your servant tried to do to me. He tried to take advantage of me. Why, he tried to rape me. Well, her husband's head explodes and grabs Joseph. I'm surprised he doesn't kill him. He throws him in the prison, this time not to wash it, but he as a prisoner. And this is Supermax. This guy is an executioner, so he basically puts Joseph on death row. Okay, now remember, 
you got one sentence to sum up everything you've just heard. One sentence, right? And we're not done yet. Because you may remember that when Joseph is in that prison cell, thinking, oh my Lord, what's happened to me? My life is doing like this. I'm, I'm all of a sudden back on the bottom again. H have you ever done the right thing and then got in trouble anyway? Have you ever stood up for what's right and it cost you? Joseph knows what that feels like. Joseph knows what it feels like to be falsely accused. And he's there in that prison. And who gets shoved in his cell but a baker and a butler? Now this sounds like some weird movie, but both of these fellows work for the same guy, the president of Egypt, the Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the land. Now you need to understand that back in the day, if you wanted to assassinate a leader, you weren't going to do it by sniper rifle because they didn't have one. And they'd have plenty of guards around them. But if you could slip something in their food, you could take them out. Now, these two men are down here in this prison, in this death row, I believe because they were probably trying to take out the Pharaoh, or maybe not. And both of them have weird dreams. And they say, oh, man, I had the weirdest dream. And they start telling Joseph. And Joseph said, man, don't tell me about dreams. Dreams have messed up my life. I don't want to talk. Do you know about dreams? Yeah, I know about dreams. Well, can you interpret my Fine, fine, I'll interpret your dreams. And the Bible says that Joseph turns to the baker and says, your dream means that you're going to be right back in Pharaoh's service and within a couple of weeks. He says, great. The butler says, what about mine? He says, your dream means that within two weeks you'll be dead. And sure enough, he was. And sure enough, he was. So the, the pardon me, I've, I've got them mixed up. The baker ends up dead. The butler ends up, the cupbearer, going back into Pharaoh's service. And as he heads back, Joseph hollers, hey, remember me to your master. But of course he doesn't. You ever had somebody you did something wonderful for forget you? Joseph knows what that feels like too. And as he goes, Joseph says, oh, well, and nothing happens. And he's not remembered until, <laughs> the story's so twisty, until Pharaoh gets up one morning and here's his butler, his cupbearer, who's been returned to service. And he's giving him his morning cup of wine or whatever. And he says, man, Pharaoh, you look rough. And Pharaoh says, I had a miserable night. I did not sleep at all. What's wrong? Oh, I had a terrible dream. What kind of dream? He said, it's so weird. Seven fat cows came up out of the Nile River. And then seven skinny cows came up right after him out of the Nile River. And the skinny cows ate the fat cows, except they didn't gain any weight. And Jim, that's the diet I've been looking for. All the beef you want, no weight gain, right? He says it was the weirdest thing. And then the same thing with ears of corn. Bottom line is, he says, it's just busting my head and I can't think. And all of a sudden, the butler says, wait a minute. I know a guy that does dreams. He's right here in your cells. Well, get him up here. And in an instant, Joseph is there, standing before Pharaoh, cleaned up. He's all of a sudden standing for the most powerful man in the land who says, can you interpret my dreams? Well, I mean, my, my God can. Well, tell me. And Joseph hears the dream, and Pharaoh says, oh, what's, what does it mean? Joseph says, sir, I, I don't know if you want to know. Because you see, those seven fat cows you were dreaming about, those are seven years of great harvest for your land. But those seven skinny cows, those are seven years of famine. And sir, during the seven years of famine, your people are going to eat up all the grain from the seven good years, and then your country is going to starve. And Pharaoh said, what could... We're going to have to do something. I'm going to need somebody. Wait a minute, you. You're so smart. I'm going to make you my head of agriculture. You're going to be in charge of making sure we save enough grain. And sure enough, that's what Joseph does. He becomes the second most powerful man in Egypt. Sound familiar? Here I go. No, here I go. No, man, that's why this is a story for all of us. And Joseph has some advice for you. Get ready for it. By the way, you have one sentence to put everything we've just talked about into one verse. Well, when Joseph saves all the grain, he not only saves enough so that Egypt is okay, but Egypt had extra. And guess who is back down in Canaan 
Those brothers of his who tried to kill him are starving. And one of them says, I hear there's grain in Egypt. And the father lets them go. And there's a scene. This is, I wish somebody would do this whole thing as a movie. I mean, there have been Prince of Egypt. Wasn't too bad. But in come the brothers to see who? Joseph. Now think about this. They're coming up here to beg for grain. Here is Joseph. And they don't recognize him. He said, why didn't they recognize him? He'd been in Egypt over 10 years at that point. In fact, he'd been in Egypt long enough that he probably, you know, dressed in the Egyptian way, kind of like King Tut. In other words, he talked like an Egyptian and walked like an Egyptian. I mean, you know what I'm saying? He's standing there, and they come up, and they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. They're still all in their same vacation Bible school costumes, right? And so when they come up, guess what they do when they stand before him? First thing they do, bow down. Sound like a dream? They bowed down. Joseph's stomach must have flipped, but they had no idea what was going on. Now you tell me, if the scoundrels that had messed up your life all of a sudden were bowing down in front of you and you had the power, what would you do? Man, payback is going to be sweet. All Joseph had to say was, these are spies. Killed him. I, I know. He yanked their chain a little bit with Benjamin's cup. But the bottom line is, he says, guys, shortly after them arriving there, it's me. And they say, what do you mean? And I can see him kind of Scooby-Doo style pulling off the makeup or the headdress or whatever. And they go, Joseph? And he says, yes, it's me, your brother. Now, of course, all of them went, oh, no, home alone face, right? Oh, no. Be, oh, but he says, no, 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 guys, relax, relax. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. That's exact face right there. Don't worry about it. He says, because what you think is for bad, God made for good. And he's got me here to take care of you. And he feeds them and he brings his father up from Egypt. And the, it's just, just a great story in the end of the whole family is together. Woohoo! And you got one verse. One verse. Buckle your seatbelts. Because when I read this verse, I thought, what? Here, take a look at it. Let's read it together. Here's the verse that's supposed to sum up the three-point shot in Joseph's life. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Who was in the truck when that verse was picked? That's what I want to know. Nothing in it about dreams, nothing in it about saving Egypt, nothing in it even about all that God had done for him. By faith... When Joseph's end was near, he spoke about the exit of Israelites from... I read it three or four times thinking, Jim, I'm missing something here. What's the big deal about that verse, Hebrews eleven twenty two? 22? I tell you, I had to go back to the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. I had to go all the way back to the story that Moses writes about this moment in order to understand it. Let me share it with you and we'll be done. Here we go. Joseph stayed in Egypt. This is verse 22 of the last chapter of the last little paragraph in Genesis. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family, lived to be 110 years old, saw the third generation of Ephraim's children, the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knee. It means he got to bounce great, great grandkids on his knee. He lived a long, long time. Now he's 110 years old. And the Bible says, then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. Well, he's 110, so he probably said, I am about to die. But, but God will surely, everybody say surely. God will, one more time, surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. That's to my great-grandpa and my grandpa and my dad. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath. God will say the word one more time. Surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. It says Joseph died at the age of 110 and after that they embalmed him and he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. End of story. I still didn't get it. I'll be honest, I had to read it two or three more times until it hit me. Did you see it? Did you see what happened? Joseph has lived in Egypt for generations. And he recognizes what's happening. 
the people there, God's people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants, had begun to forget. Or as a friend of mine says, they forgot to remember who God was. Now, I don't blame them. Because Abraham has been told, I'm going to lead you to this promised land. And Isaac was told the promised land. And Jacob is told the promised land. And then they all end up in Egypt. I imagine every birthday, Joseph would have said when they start celebrating him, now listen, you all know God's going to take us to the promised land. God's going to take us to the promised land. How many birthdays, how many years did it take before the young kids, you know, oh, Grandpa's going to do the promised land speech again. I'm so sick of this. I'm going to throw up if he does that speech one more time. Grandpa, somebody needs to tell Grandpa there is no promised land. Grandpa, this is as good as it gets. My mama's Egyptian. My mama's mama's was Egyptian. We are all born here. Dude, give it up. We'll sing the Frozen song, let it go. Because it's not happening. Whoever your God was way back then, dude, we got all kinds of gods here in Egypt. You need to get over this. And it starts to hit Joseph that he's about to die and there's going to be nobody there to remind the young generation of this. Nobody there to tell the children this story because nobody else seems to believe it. And Joseph comes up with a three-point shot. This is why this verse is here. Joseph says, Swear to me. I mean, I can see him calling one of these young kids up and saying, all right, listen, pinky swear to me. What do you want, great grandpa? Can you make a promise to me? Sure. Listen, when I die, because I'm going to die soon. I'm 110. But when I die, don't let your daddy bury me. Well, great grandpa, what do you want us to do? You just put me in a box and let me rot until it's just my bones. And then take my bones. Um, you got something to carry with? I got my backpack. Great. Put my bones in your backpack. What do you say? When you guys leave, because you're going to the promised land, you got to carry my bones. So put them in something you can take. Put them in your backpack. Great grandpa, this is really weird. What if somebody at school comes up to me and says, hey, what's in your backpack? What am I supposed to say? Oh, my great-grandpa. He says, yeah, exactly. And when they say, why is your great-grandpa in your backpack? You tell them, because this is not my home. And one day, God's going to take us to the promised land. Do you see what he's doing? I mean, it's, it's a stroke of genius. He's dying, and yet he's leaving a way for them to remember, not to forget. God will, everybody say, surely. I don't think it takes a whole lot of help to know where this lesson is heading, does it? Does it? How many songs have we sung? Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Do you know that one? Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon we are going to now, well, hold, hold it, wait, wait, but one of these kids says, well, how long have you been singing that song? Well, I was singing that song when I was your age. And we were singing just over in the promised land. And some glad morning when this life is o'er, ah, fly. Oh, yeah, listen, my grandma used to sing that song. And I wouldn't blame some of these 12 or 13-year-old kids from saying, excuse me, your grandma sung that song and it didn't happen. And your mama sung that song and it didn't happen. And, old man, you're singing that song. Maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe this is as good as it gets. And Joseph reaches out from history and taps him on the shoulder and says, God is faithful. And he will, everybody say that surely word, surely come with a trumpet call. The clouds roll back like a scroll. Jesus is coming. And the young generation says, what should make me think that? And now the scary part. Well, you ought to be able to look at the people sitting around you who have come to this building, who've taken a piece of bread and drank a little bit of juice, who've sung these songs and said, I believe that God will surely 
fulfill his promises. You see, mom and dad, grandpa and grandma, they're looking at us. They're wondering if we think this is it. So here's Joseph's advice. Look where you're heading. Look where you're going. Because it's awfully easy for us with those little glowing tablets to, oh my, what about that? What about, oh, can you see what's happening? Can you believe that? And Joseph says, dude, look where you're going. Because you're going to the promised land. Amen? Because one day, one day, all of the junk and all of the challenge and all of the mess and if I'm heading that way, if I'm looking that way, then my time and my talent and my treasure are all going to be pointed that way. Grandpa, if that's really where you're heading, if, re if you really believe it, then the grandkids will see it in the way you spend your time and how you treat Grandma. They will see it in the way that you focus, in the way that you read God's Word, in the prayers that you say. Mom and Dad, sorry to put the press on you, but those kids are looking at you. And they're wondering, do mom and dad believe that one day Jesus is coming? And it's not enough for us just to say we do. We have to keep our eyes on where we're going. Because if you don't look where you're going, you're probably going to end up somewhere else. <laughs> oh, I'll tell this fast to quit. Um, I saw a lady in the Chicago airport text her way right into a pillar. She, she was dressed up in this fancy black uh, dress suit, and she was pulling a rollerboard. And the only reason I saw her, because she ran the rollerboard right over my, my, my toe and didn't say a thing. She was late, right? And she was texting with her left hand and pulling and zipping through the airport. And they've got these huge pillars in some of the halls there in the airport in Chicago. And this woman had her head... <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. She had her head down like this, and she's texting, and she's literally running, pulling this rollerboard, and I'm looking at her, and I see she's heading straight for one of those pillars. And I thought, well, she'll look up, you know, and it's going to be an embarrassing moment, and I'm sorry to say I was looking forward to it, you know, with her kind of going, oh, my goodness, oh, excuse me, well, you know, something like that. She didn't look up. Dude, she sailed straight into that pillar, hit it with the top of her head. The pillar had some kind of metal on it that made it go boing when he hit it. So everybody turned and looked, and she started wobbling like this on her high heels. And I thought, oh, she's going down, <laughs> you know. But she hung on to her rollerboard and got herself squared away, looked around, looked at the pillar. Word of honor, she says, who put that there? And then zipped on around it. I had to laugh, but then I realized that's us. We get so focused on the here and now, so focused on what's happening right in front of us that we forget soon and very soon we are going to see the... Are you ready? Soon and very soon we are going to see the... Is that where your life is pointed? Maybe you've never given your heart and life to Jesus. Maybe you've never been baptized into Christ. Can I ask you, do you want to go to the promised land? Do you want to be ready when he comes? And whether you're 13 or whether you're 63, the best decision you can possibly make is to keep your eyes on where you're heading. Because Paul later writes this. He says, listen, take a look in Corinthians. He says, God has a plan. And we know that if this earthly tent we live in is destroyed, We've got a building from God, a house not made with hands, an eternal house in heaven. Can we all say, and God will surely fulfill his promises. I, uh, as a kid, my favorite cartoon was always the Roadrunner. Y'all had the Roadrunner out here in Texas, didn't you? Remember the Roadrunner was chased by the coyote? What was the coyote's name? I always... Oh, wow, look at this wily e. coyote, right? And he'd always get the stuff from Acme and, and try and get... And the funniest thing was he'd get so close to catching that roadrunner. And as a little kid watching this cartoon on Saturdays, I thought that bird is the smartest bird in the world because he always gets away. I mean, you know, a truck comes out of a painted tunnel and mows down wily e. coyote or, or, the, or the hill closed, but the, but the cleft where the little uh, roadrunner standing on, it stays standing. The bird always got away, except a friend of mine said there's one cartoon where he gets caught and killed and eaten by the coyote. 
And I said, no way. He said, you got to watch. So, man, I'm watching, you know, each week. Oh, no, but he always gets away. I didn't know my buddy had tricked me. And I was an adult until I actually figured out, do you know why the Roadrunner always got away? Because he had an agreement with the writer of the cartoon. That no matter what happened, no matter how bad it looked, no matter what occurred, COVID or anything else, the writer of the cartoon wrote him a good ending every time. Well, guess what we have? Because of Jesus Christ, we have an agreement with the writer of history. Doesn't mean we're never going to have a difficulty. But whether it's cancer or COVID or an economic crash, here's the guarantee. You just look where you're heading, and God will say it one last time, surely, faithfully. We know God is faithful. The question is, will we have faith? It's very practical for me because in a few hours, I'll head over to the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, and I'll get on a plane. That plane will take off to take me back to California. Well, what if? Somebody says, you're saying God's going to always take care of you? Well, yeah, but it doesn't mean bad things can't happen. So what if my plane takes off and it has a problem? What if an engine shakes or, or, or explodes? What if the other engine falls off? And at the same moment, what if the pilot has a, has a heart attack and the co-pilot looks over and has a stroke because of it? And a guy in front of me jumps up and says, I've got bombs, I'm a terrorist. And the lady behind drops her cigarette and lights the plane on fire. What if every bad thing possible happens to my plane as I'm leaving DFW and pretty soon it is soaring towards the ground? Well, doesn't mean my God has forgotten me. Because let me tell you what, if that plane does right into the ground, the last thing that Satan is going to hear from me is he's whispering, oh, hey, looks like God wasn't surely going to take care of you. The last thing he'll hear from me when that plane explodes is meep, meep, and I'm going to heaven. <laughs> because I have an agreement with the writer of history. Can I get a oh, yeah? Yeah.